I know. No. So um, I want to welcome everybody to the final round of the fourth annual Five Minute Fast Track competition um, for our undergraduate researchers. So my name is Chad Risco. Um, I'm the faculty director of the Office of Undergraduate Research. And so sort of representing that office, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you to the competition. Um, I'll note for everybody that's sitting in the audience that this is being live streamed on Facebook. So to the like tens of people out there, hi. Um, um, but before we get started, of course, I want to recognize the folks that really make this happen. Um, and that's our wonderful staff in the Office of Undergraduate Research, um, starting with Jesse Bowman. Um, thank you, Jesse. Um, for those who have not met her, our newest staff member, Haven Patrick. We have two fantastic student workers, Emily and Madison. They're running around somewhere, yeah. And then we also are being assisted today um, by the Office of Undergraduate Research Ambassadors who are undergraduate researchers on campus representing a, a wide variety of research and creative activity across campus um, that really serve um, are an important role of discussing the importance of what you guys do um, on campus and, and trying to get more people involved, which is what we want. Um, so the purpose of this competition is to um, give our undergraduate researchers an opportunity to practice presenting the impact and importance of their work to a general audience. And that's not easy, right? Um, as scientists or as people who write are often, you know, dive deep into a particular topic, we love jargon, right? And that jargon is often difficult to get around. And so this is an opportunity um, for them to, uh, to work on those skills and so that, you know, we can really tell, so that they can tell their stories, but as an institution, we can tell this, you know, tell better stories about what we do here at the University of Kentucky. Um, so with that, I would like to take a moment and introduce our three judges. There we go. Uh, yeah, so um, our, well, I guess we're going to go in order here. Um, so the first judge there on the right is Rodney Andrews. Um, Dr. Andrews is a senior associate vice president for research. Um, he's also the director for the Center for Applied Energy Research and a professor of um, chemical and materials engineering in the College of Engineering. Next, we have Dean Christian Brady. Um, dean Brady is, is the dean of the Lewis Honors College, um, and he is professor of modern and classical languages, literatures and cultures, and Jewish studies. It's a lot to say. <laughs> so it's a lot of, there, that, that does, is that the department with the longest title? Yes, it's a department that has about uh, eight different disciplines in it. Yep, yeah, so it, it's pretty impressive, the, the things that are there. And then, Finally, we have Ms. Tanya Phillips. Um, hello. Um, Ms. Phillips is the director for the University of Kentucky Office of um, Technology and Commercialization. Um, and so if you have a technology that you are creating, Tanya's the person to talk to. And, and she may reach out to some of you afterwards, right, um, based on, on what you guys present um, today. So I think with that, um, we're gonna to hear today from 10 finalists. Um, we started with 17 uh, about 10 days ago um, in the preliminary rounds. And so these are 10 that were judged to be, I don't wanna say the best, right? But you guys rose to the top, right? It was an excellent competition that we had a week ago, Monday. And um, you know the scoring was very tight. Um, so you know it's, it's a real honor for us to have you here um, to share your work and, and to, to show us what, you, what you've got to present. Um, so before we get started, because I think it's time that we do that, I do want to go over um, the rules real quick. Um, so there's gonna be an introduction slide. Um, so when you come up, that introduction slide will be there. You will introduce yourself, and then you will start your presentation when we click the slide over, okay? Um, for your presentation, you will have five minutes, and five minutes only. Um, if you hear Thank you, Dean Brady. The bell, you need to stop talking, right? Um, if you continue on, that means automatic disqualification, okay? Um, I know it's quite rough. 
Um, <laughs> we don't, yeah, so, um, so listen for the bell. But to give you a little bit of warning, there are gonna be two cards that Jesse will hold up, Dean Brady will show here now. Um, the first is the yellow card, and, and Jesse is gonna be sitting right here in the corner, so maybe keep an eye out, right, as you get a little bit into your talk. The first is a yellow card for a one minute warning. The second then is the red card for a 30 second warning. And as you see that, that's the time to really start thinking about wrapping it up, okay? Um, we will then have just a few minutes afterwards for judges to ask questions um, and fill out the rubric, um, at least with those preliminary scores. Um, after the final presentation, so again, we're gonna have 10 presenters. After the final presentation, um, the judges and, and we on the staff will, will gather in a separate space, tabulate those scores. We'll ask everybody to wait around um, until we come back with those tabulated scores, and then we will announce the winners when everything is done. Okay? Are there any questions from anybody? No? Okay. I think we are in good shape to get started. Good evening. My name is Chase Easton, and I am a junior studying agricultural and medical biotechnology. I work in the Department of Plant Pathology under Dr. Peter Nagy. So as my title suggests, I am concerned with identifying different domains of a recruitment protein known as P33 involved in a necessary step of viral replication. Most viruses within the family of Tumbus viridae have a relatively small amount of genetic material. That means they only contain about five genes in their genome. So they have to recruit or basically steal necessary and normal components of the cell known as host factors. And you can see there in my diagram how different domains of P33 interact with some of those host factors that are represented there by the oval shapes. In fact, P33 alone can interact with over 400 host factors. Unfortunately, as P33 steals these normal components of the cell, the cell begins to die as the virus replicates. That is why some viruses within Tumbus viridae can damage and destroy necessary crops. So, to help uh, eliminate this food destruction, it is essential that we better understand the relationship between these viral proteins and host factors. So a viral replication organelle, or a VRO, is a cluster of host factors that have been recruited from all over the cell by P33 and a couple of its friends to the site of viral replication. And we can actually see these VROs under the microscope using a fluorescent protein that allows us to essentially tag a specific host factor known as peroxisomes. So essentially, when we're looking at this under the microscope, when we see a cluster of those red dots there, that suggests to us that a VRO is present. And what peroxisomes specifically do, among other things, is they help defend the replication complex from antiviral agents that are trying to detect P33 and destroy it. So what I am specifically concerned with is identifying what domains of P33 cause the aggregation of these peroxisomes. And so what we do is we express P33 in tobacco leaves. Now this P33 has been genetically engineered to one, glow green, and two, have specifically mutated domains of interest. And so essentially what we do then is look to see if these VROs form in the presence of these non-functional domains. Now, if we see a cluster of red dots, then we know that that domain is not necessary for VRO formation. However, as you can see, whenever we mutated the transmembrane domain, we didn't see a cluster of red dots. So we know that the transmembrane domains, which are highlighted there, and it's those yellow blocks, are necessary for the aggregation of these peroxisomes. So how do we express what we have concocted in the lab into these cells? It's a process known as agroinfiltration. So a postdoc in our lab genetically engineers these genes here 
to glow green and also have the mutated domains. Then he puts them in a vector or a plasmid, which is similar to a circular gene, amplifies the amount of plasmids, and then basically hands me the plasmids at this step here. And then I put them into a different type of bacteria called agrobacterium. And basically, agrobacterium does all the work for us once we inject the agrobacterium into the plant because it thinks that it is injecting its own plasmid into the cells. So what we are able to take away from this is that P33 actually bonds with itself. So what we hope to do is express mutated P33 in the cell, and then when viruses infect the plant, the mutated P33 will bind with the healthy P33 and prevent VRO formation. So all in all, we are concerned with better understanding the communication or the dance, so to speak, between these host factors and P33 to block the viral replication process and prevent necessary food destruction. Thank you. Well, Chase, I'm kind of the canary in the coal mine here, um, being the humanist. Uh, I'll just start with what is P33? So P33 is just the name that we've given to, based off its molecular weight, it's about 33 kilodaltons. It's just a protein that my professor has termed the master regulator of Tumbus viridae because it is a recruitment protein that serves a variety of roles in recruiting all of these different host factors to the site of viral replication so that a couple of other uh, viral proteins can then help use all of these host components to replicate the viruses. That was good. Thank you very much. So I'll just ask, have you been able to look further down the line to see um, how this might be used in a commercial application and in what types of crops? So we are not necessarily to that next step yet, but to answer that second part, some of the crops that we are concerned with are tomato plants and cucumber plants. And so our next step to kind of understand how that bonding happens together, we are actually gonna change some of those green rings to blue and then watch specifically how P33 interacts with other P33, more so than how it interacts with those red dots, which are the paroxysms. I just have a question more about the slide than anything. What are we looking at where it says location and cell? Okay, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So in the first three pictures here, we have blocked out the background so that you can only see the P33 and the peroxisomes. But basically that location in the cell is essentially just a photo that we took with regular light in the cell. And so you can see right here, this is actually the membrane of a cell. And so it just helps you understand a little bit that these photos weren't just uh, concocted in a laboratory. They actually were in a plant cell. Thanks, Studies in neuroscience, but I'm primarily a sociology student. I've had the great honor of conducting research here at UK for the last three years and also in collaboration with Louisiana State University this summer under the supervision of agricultural economics professor Dr. Jared Penn. When was the last time you considered swatting at a bee? Do you remember what came to mind or how you felt? According to polls from the USDA, virtually all Americans, up to 95 percent, agree in the importance of pollinator biodiversity and the creation of efforts like pollinator habitats. But only two thirds of us feel solid and confident that we understand how to actually improve the environment for pollinators. And only 10% of us have actionably been involved. In an effort to try to eliminate the barriers for implementation for more pollinator friendly practices, specifically regarding lawn care, our LSU team provided a survey that was provided through, Qual through Qualtrics survey um, and advertised through, um, advertised through online means and proliferated. 
And as you can see, you have the results of 1,317 respondents. Our survey had components ascertaining respondents' ability to identify common insects, including the honeybee, their willingness to install or pay for or implement pollinator-friendly practices, and if they had conducted this type of implementation before. Take a moment, if you will, and try to answer the first question provided above in the component and see if you can identify a honeybee out of the six photographs. If you answered E, you would be one of the 40% of respondents, low number, that correctly identified the honey honeybee among commonly misidentified insects, such as yellow jackets or bumblebees. We also identified that 25% of the respondents had a fear of honeybees, which they acknowledged may have an impact on their behavior to harm or to help them. We also had 12% of respondents say that they had an allergy to bees. And in their written responses, respondents acknowledged that this may be the reason why they felt less likely to implement or change their practices. 82% of our respondents said that they felt like pollinators were critical to the environment. And 95%, again, like those national polls, said the environment was important to them in any way. In the second component that you can see above, we used an ordered logit model, which means that we coded their information, a number one, for whether they agreed or had already implemented the practice, a two, whether they were unsure, and three, if they disagreed with the practice. And if you see a more positive coefficient, so a higher number, it means that they were um, more opposed to the, to the implementation or unwilling, and a more negative number means that they were more willing to implement. As you can see, the numbers for whether they would implement um, a certain number of one gallon pollinator plants like you would see in the bottom. This is assuming they're provided for free like many national programs already offer. Are strong uh, opinionated for larger amounts. You can see that the numbers are more positive if we said that they might be interested in planting 12 plants versus only three of those one gallon plants. You can also see that the numbers are significantly different when it comes to their own implementation or whether it's their neighbor. We asked because we were trying to consider social pressures in this. And their opinion on whether their neighbor did it was, that's, that's OK with me. That doesn't involve any work on my part. What was complicating, though, is that the lawn mullet theory is one that's commonly held in ag econ, meaning that you're more likely to let things grow up in the back. You're not worried about the HOA. Um, and you might be more willing to implement practices that are good for our pollinator friends. We found, though, that there was no statistical significant difference um, between those responses, which is not something that we expected to see. And then in the third component for pollinator plant implementation, we were seeing whether they had put these in their yards before. And only around 9% of respondents, and you can see broken down by species what they'd used in the past, had ever planted any of these in their front or backyard of any kind. This is on par with national polls that say around 10% of people might have been involved in some way, shape, or form. What we're hopeful for is that many people were willing to plant maybe three free one gallon plants, um, and that they don't think particularly badly about milkweed or coneflower, for example, especially once they get educated. When the costs are removed and knowledge is improved for people, their implementation to help our pollinator friends drastically improves. And we hope that's what will provide a brighter ecosystem starting in our own backyard. Thank you so much, and I'll be happy to answer questions. So if I want to help and um, I want to plant uh, three of these, like where can I go to do that? Like, is there a communication plan around this where you know you guys are telling people if you just um, plant three plants, then you know they're helping the environment? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the next sort of move in a, in a public policy direction should be just that to amplify the efforts that have already been kind of committed by national organizations to say some that you can Google, you put in your zip code, and it'll say, I see you live in central Kentucky. Here are the plants that would be best for bees and other pollinators, even bats, mosquitoes, um, for your area, and they'll ship them to you free of charge, which is really, really great. Because a lot of people's barrier is, well, I don't have time to research what's best, or how, how do I know that I'm going to be able to purchase that in a box store? Um, and they often can't. So I, yes, I think that's the next step for things, and that's what needs to be publicized. So I got a couple of questions, I think. Um, in the, the, the middle chart, if I understood you correctly, you said the bigger the number, the more positive the number, the less likely they are to do it or want to do mm -hmm. it. 
So folks are okay with putting with planting a couple of plants, um, but they don't want to do a dozen, right? Am I reading that correctly? Yes. Okay. So sociology, did you say ag econ as well? Uh, yes, that, that was um, Dr. Penn's profession, yeah. Okay. I'm here as an environmental sociologist. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm going to ask you an unfair question probably coming sure. off the, the <laughs> slide. So sorry about that, Dr. Risco. Um, which is, if you were to put this in economic terms, because we heard a ton, golly, mm -hmm. it's already been about eight or nine years now, about um, colony collapse and the impact that would have on our economy. What, what would be the financial argument you would make to the state the government, the extension agency, or then to a homeowner like me to say, here's the, the economic savings mm -hmm. or, or the, you know, the, the economic impact if we don't do it, the, the positive impact if we do. Can you quantify that in some way for me in terms of what we're going to lose, what the larger financial impact will be if I don't plant those three uh, cone flowers? Yeah, I can, I can sure do my best. Um, I know that kind of like our 95% our number ascribes. People, people don't want to hurt bees. They have complicated views. They don't quite have all of the knowledge of how the bee is going to hurt them. They're very unlikely to sting you if they do. Um, you can even be very patient with them and sometimes they'll even twist the sting around on their own because they didn't want to sting you to begin with and they don't want to die. So if you can keep that patience, sometimes they'll leave. I know it hurts, <laughs> so we don't always have that patience. Um, but bees are one of the most critical things, and, and pollinators in general, which is many species, it includes birds and, and many others too, um, are so critical to our food system and our ecosystem. Um, and that's primarily how we have kind of the infrastructure that we have to feed the world currently. And if they are dying, yes, by those numbers, that's up to 40% annually due to colony collapse and then other issues, um, we don't really have a backup plan other than more spending um, than what would be for this to create the new the new houses or artificial systems to replace what they do in our in our world. We need them. Thank you, Emily. Andrew, any other questions? family. You chat, you eat lunch, and overall you have a great time. Unknown to you, however, is that the deli meat you had on your sandwich was contaminated with bacteria. Depending on the species, you might experience some nausea or gastrointestinal discomfort. And while that's definitely annoying, you'll be able to resume your everyday life soon afterwards. But what if those bacteria could spread from your gut to your brainstem, causing disease in your brain, all from a piece of contaminated food? Now, instead of being nauseated, you might have a headache, swelling of your brainstem, and face potential loss of motor function. The bacterial pathogen I work with, Listeria monocytogenes, is the third leading cause of death from foodborne illness in the United States. This pathogen poses a huge risk for the food industry, because unlike many other bacteria, it can continue to replicate even at low temperatures, like those found in your refrigerator. Listeriosis, the disease associated with this pathogen, is relatively rare, but 20 to 30% of people that get it die as a result. It primarily affects those with weakened immune systems and pregnant individuals. Even scarier though, there are certain strains of this bacteria that can spread to your brainstem, even if you are young and otherwise healthy. We refer to these strains as neurotropic, which simply means that they're able to invade tissues of the nervous system. Our lab has previously found that these strains make it to the brain without becoming abundant in the bloodstream. So we think that some event in the gut allows these bacteria access to the brain. Our hypothesized route of dissemination, as shown on the left side of the slide, is that as food contaminated with listeria passes through the lumen of the small intestine, the blue area of the box, some of these bacteria, shown as green structures, are then able to cross the protective layer of intestinal epithelium by first moving into these cells and then exiting out the other side into the lamina propria, the beige area of the box. We found that these strains do not invade neurons very well, but they can invade enteric glial cells about two to three times more efficiently than other Listeria strains. Enteric glial cells, shown in yellow, surround, support, and are in direct contact with fibers of the vagus nerve that innervate the gut. So, we think that these strains first invade into these enteric glial cells, and then utilizing cell-to-cell -cell spread, a mechanism Listeria frequently uses to move throughout the body, 
they spread from these glial cells directly into the adjacent neurons. Once there, they can travel intracellularly all the way up the vagus nerve until they reach the brainstem. Invasion into specific cell types is mediated by bacterial surface proteins. As you can see diagrammed in the upper right, these proteins interact with components on the surface of the target cell, promoting entry of the bacteria into the cell. Our lab has found that there are 14 surface proteins that are in these neurotropic listeria strains that are not found in non-neurotropic strains. Of these 14, five have structural similarities to known invasion factors of listeria. These factors allow listeria to invade into intestinal epithelium tissue, like you saw previously in the box, or into cells in your liver. So we think that one of these five similar proteins might confer the ability to invade into enteric glial cells so well. My project has focused on taking one of these five proteins and creating a mutant where the gene that encodes for it has been deleted. The protein I've been investigating is referred to as 1096. Once I created my deletion mutant, I've now been testing it against its parent neurotropic strain to see how the two compare. To do so, I have conducted experiments where I have a cultured enteric glial cell line, and I add these listeria strains to the cells. Then, I quantify how many of those bacteria were able to make it inside of the cells during an hour-long incubation. As you can see on the bar graph in the bottom right, the loss of this protein causes a reduced capability of these strains to make it inside these enteric glial cells. The y-axis, percent invasion, is a measure of how many bacteria we recover from the inside of these cells versus how many we added to the dish in the first place. The bar on the far right, which represents the strain that has had gene 1096 deleted, um, no longer acts like its parent neurotropic strain. This loss of the protein 1096 makes it basically incapable of invading into these enteric glial cells at the same level it once did. Bacteria have a whole host of mechanisms that they can use to move throughout our bodies and to cause diseases. And by better understanding these pathways, we can target them for therapeutics and for treatments of these deadly infections. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tanner. Um, very clear, and just even for uh, even for even for me. Um, so, a question occurs to me, though, of in terms of therapy, um, therapeutic use. That is, how would how would a, a consumer, you know, one consuming food, how would you know you need this? How quickly do you hypothesize that the um, uh, the listeria is going through the gut and up into these cells? Is, are you gonna it, would a, a a patient have enough time to know? Whoa, and take a Tums equivalent uh, of your 1096, and away you go. Yeah, I guess it, would be, it would be something that would cause that to happen. But yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, we're not exactly at that stage yet, and unfortunately, the issue with listeria is that frequently you don't know whether you have consumed that bacteria until later on, um, and even more so, these strains that possess neurotropic capabilities are from a genetic lineage that have not been studied very well in the listeria field, so we don't know that much about them at all. Um, in terms of our mouse model, they typically make it to the brain about four days post-infection, mm -hmm. so potentially some sort of therapeutic could block the majority of bacteria getting to that point, um, but it would take a lot more research to figure out exactly what symptoms might occur in the early stages of that infection and being able to predict whether that infection would actually progress to the brain or not. Okay, first of all, now I'm scared. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go home and clean out my refrigerator. <laughs> um, so what, what is the current standard of care and has, uh, it, has there been any comparison to, to that in terms of treating listeria? So the current way that we treat listeriosis in patients um, is just with normal antibiotics. The primary issue is that, as you can see from the hypothesized route of dissemination, these bacteria spread primarily intracellularly, and antibiotics aren't able to cross that cell membrane to make it inside of our cells. So listeria infections are frequently resistant to antibiotics, which is why we need to find some new method um, to help treat these deadly infections. How did you knock out protein 1096? 
It was through homologous recombination. So essentially, I created a, I took a plasmid, which is just a circular piece of DNA, and I included the regions of the genome that are upstream and downstream of the gene, and then transformed that into listeria. And so transformation is just adding the plasmid into the cell. Then by promoting um, recombination events, I could force the plasmid to integrate, and then it would loop out, and half of the ones that looped out would either have the gene left, and half would have it gone. But I added, um, we essentially confirmed by genetic sequencing to make sure that the gene was deleted. And the results that we got, this gene was the only thing that was altered in the chromosome, in this new mutant strain. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone. My name is McKenna Clinch, and I'm a junior chemical engineering major. The research I will be presenting on is from my summer program at Auburn University with my mentor, Dr. Brian Beckenkamp. So this summer, I worked with phenylacrylate polymer membranes for energy generation. In 1950, the world emitted 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide. In 2020, 34.81 billion tons of CO2 was released into the atmosphere. This is a 580% increase in just the past 70 years, and it will only continue to increase if we as humans do not do anything to combat this issue. One possibility for reducing carbon dioxide emissions is fuel cells. Solar power, sol solar power fuel cells use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide into chemicals that can be used for energy generation. These fuel cells are currently used as backup power for buildings and power plants. A more recent focus for their use has been on vehicles. Imagine how much carbon dioxide we could remove from the atmosphere if every car you saw driving on the road was powered by a fuel cell. One component of these fuel cells is the polymer ion exchange membrane that separates the two different parts of the cell as seen on this diagram here. A polymer is a material that is composed of multiple identical repeating units, and if that material allows for things to pass through it, then it can be an ion exchange membrane. The, this membrane is crucial in limiting the crossover of the reaction products that occur in the two different parts of the cell. Without this membrane, products from one side of the cell would go into the other side where they could be converted back into carbon dioxide. Since the goal of the membrane is to reduce crossover, one of the most important characteristics of it is its permeability. Perme permeability measures the amount of ions, which is just the charged part of a solution, that can pass through a membrane over a given period of time. I studied permeability as well as water volume fraction throughout my experiments. Water volume fraction shows how much space is in a membrane for things to pass through. The goal of my research was to find a membrane that had a lower permeability and water volume fraction than the current commercial membranes used. The two main components of a membrane are the crosslinker and the monomer. A crosslinker is the structural backbone for the membrane, and the monomer binds to the crosslinker and is what allows for things to permeate through. Phenylacrylate is an additional monomer that can be added to these two components to change the membrane properties. Keeping phenylacrylate concentration the same, I varied monomer and crosslinker composition for three different membranes to see how it would affect their properties. To do this, I created solutions of these different compositions and allowed them to set in an oven for 10 hours. After that, I ran my permeability experiments. And this happens in a diffusion cell, which you can see under the procedures section of my slide. A diffusion cell contains a receiver cell and a donor cell with a membrane separating the two different parts. The receiver cell has distilled water with a conductivity probe in it, and the donor cell has salt solution in it. Over time, salt will permeate through the membrane into the donor cell. The conductivity meter will then measure the conductivity, which basically, basically shows how many charged particles are in the solution. From here, permeability can be calculated. Water volume fraction is measured by taking different weight measurements of the membrane. I measured the membrane when it was submerged in water, when it was dry, and when it was swollen. Then, through an equation, water volume fraction can be calculated. My results showed that as, as monomer composition increased, permeability and water volume fraction increased as well. The membrane with zero monomer composition actually had permeability values three orders of magnitude lower than the other two membranes I measured. 
The water volume fraction results are used to strengthen the permeability results as the results were consistent. If there is a lower water volume fraction, then there should be more, less space in the membrane, so it's harder for things to pass through. And that is what my results concluded. Based on my results, the phenylacrylate membrane with zero monomer concentration is the most promising membrane to be used in a fuel cell. Based on its low permeability and low water volume fraction, it will provide minimal crossover from the two different parts of the cell. However, water volume fraction and permeability are just two of the membrane characteristics that have to be tested before it can be put into an actual cell. If I had more time, my next steps would be to study these other characteristics and see if having zero monomer concentration negatively impacts the characteristics. After all this testing, the final goal is to have a membrane that could be put into a fuel cell that can replace the current membranes that are inefficient and expensive that we use today. Thank you. So I'm just curious, um, because I have to ask this, did you guys, was this membrane um, novel? Like, d does it exist on the market today, or uh, did you guys discover something that is not currently in use in the marketplace? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there's actually, um, these membranes are not commercially used right now, and it's a very recent field of study. And so we kind of just have a checklist of a bunch of different polymer membranes that can be made. And we're basically just trying all of them possible. And so uh, the phenylacrylate membranes were one that have not been studied before. No one in my lab had done them before. And so we were just trying to see how phenylacrylate affects the membrane since it is just another polymer that people can work with. This should be an easy question. So <laughs> it's about your fuel cell. So I'm, I'm assuming this is a hydrogen fuel cell. Is that, is that what we're talking about? That hydrogen is what comes out as the fuel? Yes. Okay, so that equation. Yes, there, right here. That's, okay, so we're reading left to right in that instance. And fuel, what well, you have fuel there is just hydrogen, right? Um, yes. H2. So, well, the fuel is also a product of these different chemicals. So formate, acetate, and ethanol. And then hydrogen is also produced in that. And so uh, combining these chemicals together is oh, okay. what so it's not a, a, it's not not a, a like, pure hydrogen no. fuel cell. Okay. No, Very the good. energy is not just based from the hydrogen. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first question I would have is one of the very key characteristics for any of these ion exchange membranes is bleed over and how long the membrane will last before that becomes an issue. Have you measured the lifetime of these membranes? Um, so current commercial membranes are lasting about two to three weeks. And uh, so that's obviously not ideal. We don't want to replace a membrane every two to three weeks. And um, so uh, that is not something that I have done tests on yet because the, we are just trying to find membranes that would work first before we could even test them in a fuel cell. And so we have to study all these other characteristics before we worry about the bleed over. Okay, and then in your permeativity mm -hmm. or permeability measurement, what did you look at crossing the membrane? So um, I used four different salt solutions and I used formates and acetates. And so uh, the conductivity would basically measure how much formate or acetate has moved over into the um, receiver side of the cell. Okay, and did you measure swelling of the membrane? Um, that was one of the water volume fraction measurements, but we just focused on the swelling just for the water volume fraction, not necessarily for any other purpose. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm a senior neuroscience major, and I research with Dr. David Rogers in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry. When you think of chronic disease in Kentucky, what comes to mind? For me, it's type 2 diabetes, which has been diagnosed in 14% of Kentucky adults. That's one in seven Kentuckians, or almost 475,000 people. 
my lab is a part of the University of Kentucky's Diabetes and Obesity Research Priority Area and seeks to improve understanding and treatment of type 2 diabetes. Specifically, we studied the insulin-degrading enzyme, which we like to refer to as IDE. If you're curious as to what IDE looks like, I've included a model on the far left of my slide. IDE is a human protein responsible for breaking down molecules like insulin and the amyloid beta peptide, which is involved in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Furthermore, diabetes patients often develop Alzheimer's disease later in life. So understanding how IDE functions could someday explain why these diseases occur together and enable the development of life-changing drugs. Now, before I joined the lab, our team established that the insulin-degrading enzyme is typically located in the cytosol, or general water-filled compartment of a cell. Insulin is a hormone, which means that it travels through the bloodstream, moving from cell to cell. Like most molecules we find in human cells, insulin is brought into the cell through a process called endocytosis, when it is packaged in a small, membrane-bound compartment called an endosome. The diagram near the center of my poster demonstrates this process, where the large gray boundary represents the cell. Insulin is represented by the green dot. Insulin receptors are blue. Endosomes are represented by the large purple circles. And the insulin-degrading enzyme, the molecule we are studying, is represented by the green rectangle. We know that IDE gets inside endosomes. It has to in order to break down the insulin trapped inside. But we don't know how. Our hypothesis is as follows. The insulin-degrading enzyme interacts with a molecule embedded in the endosome lining called a phosphatidyl inositol phosphate lipid, or PIP for short. My project involves measuring the binding affinity of healthy human IDE as compared to mutant versions of the protein. We call this healthy, naturally occurring IDE wild type. Binding affinity is a measurement of how tightly IDE binds to the molecules with which it interacts, and can be measured through a process called an ELISA assay. I spend most days in lab running these tests, which take about three and a half hours each. The first step of our ELISA assay involves binding artificial PIP lipids, or a polypipsome, to the bottom of a well plate. IDE is then bound to these PIP lipids. At the top right of my slide, IDE is represented by the green rectangular shape and is added to the assay at varying concentrations. Primary and secondary antibodies are then bound to IDE, followed by a substrate, which fluoresces yellow to indicate it's been broken down by IDE. If our IDE is functional, greater IDE concentrations should have more digestive abilities and produce a brighter yellow color. The results of our experiments are summarized at the bottom right of my slide. The tall curve at the top of the graph represents wild-type IDE. As we expected, fluorescence increased with protein concentration. The curve coming partway up the graph represents a mutant form of IDE with reduced digestive abilities and reduced PIP interactions. Finally, the blue data points at the bottom of the graph represent an IDE mutant with no digestive abilities and no PIP interactions. This data suggests that wild-type IDE does bind to endosomal PIP lipids which then pull IDE through the membrane, giving it access to insulin and the other endosome contents. Furthermore, this data supports our hypothesis and will be published in our forthcoming manuscript. To reiterate, the insulin-degrading enzyme is involved in the development of Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes. The true value of this research, therefore, comes from its therapeutic applications and its potential for drug development. Considering one in seven Kentuckians is currently being treated for type 2 diabetes, these drugs could have life-changing impacts. I feel incredibly lucky to have been a part of such monumental research, and I cannot wait to see how our findings revolutionize healthcare. Thank you. On. So you're showing the data down in mm -hmm. the bottom right. How replicable is this? How many iterations are done and, and how does that look in terms of repeatability and yeah. replicability? So this is very repeatable. Each assay has um, at least three trials per condition. So each of these data points in the error bars are from at least three. And most of these have been repeated between three and five times. 
Um, we have pretty low margins of error, so we expect this will continue to be repeatable. Um, we are still finishing up a few of our control tests before we go forth with publication, but this is very consistent, very strong data. So just to be clear that I've understood, because mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't drift off, but I mean, I, I was with you and I wasn't. So um, your, your final chart there, mm -hmm. so what we're saying is the IDE, this is our insulin degrading enzyme, that's bad. So IDE is essential to normal physiological processes. So that's the normal. But if it's overactive or underactive, that can have biological consequences. Uh, so, so then tell this idiot again what, what we've got on your, on your chart on the lower right. Yeah. The wild type is, is just normal, yes. healthy IDE. Yes. It is connecting with PIP. Yes. And that's and, good, we think. We're trying to understand how it gets. Oh, I see. Cells. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Yes. And Gladys so, Knight is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> bad joke. So, no, no, nobody knows what I'm saying. Okay, all right. Thank you. I, I don't even know where to ask a question on this, Lexi, but thank you again. Actually, I've got one other question, yes. kind of random. Did you do 4 H public speaking by any chance? I was in speech and debate. There we go. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just sort of thought it was going to be some sort of mystical, magical combination of the two. They can be. Yeah, absolutely. This is actually like a scientific conference. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Vidros. I'm a senior biology major. I've been doing research in the Department of Pharmacology and Nutritional Science under Dr. Elsa Raj from the CASAS lab. So I wanted to open up with a fact about the prevalence of aortic aneurysms. Every year, 200,000 Americans will be diagnosed with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And if you're thinking that a problem with your aorta is never a good thing, then you're absolutely right. Cardiovascular disease remains to be the number one killer of Americans and even humans globally today. What I've been looking at is a specific form of aortic disease called an aortic aneurysm. So for those who do not know, the aorta is the central blood vessel that supplies oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. An aneurysm is where specific proteins will eat away at the walls of the aorta, causing this bulge that we see here. This bulge is scary because it can go to the point of rupture and almost certain death. My lab has previously shown that this specific serotonin receptor called the 5-HT3R receptor was more highly expressed in male mice who are more prone to aortic disease than females. So we had also previously seen that if we managed to block the receptor activity, we could see less areas of aortic disease. So that's a good sign. The purpose of this study then was to try to increase the receptor and bring it back up and see what would happen and see if, see if we had the same results. So we did exactly that. We took our four male mice, we separated the aortas into a thoracic and abdominal region. That is just an upper and lower region. After many steps of, steps of isolation, we isolated the cells that make up the aorta, which are smooth muscle cells. Then we ran our cells through a gel to measure the amount of MMP2 enzyme product that they would make. MMP2 is one of those hallmark enzyme proteins that eats away and causes this bulging that we see in the aneurysm. And if you ever thought that real estate and biology had nothing in common, I encourage you to think again. Just like when you want to sell your house, we saw that location matters, and we got different results for our upper and lower sections. Our upper section didn't see a significant difference between our treatment groups. Group one was our untreated control group. Group two was our angiotensin two group. Angiotensin two is just a molecule we like to add to accelerate the disease process so we have a nice disease model to study. Group three was our molecule that would increase the receptor activity. And group four was, again, our disease model from our ANG2 and our increased receptor activity molecule. And things got really interesting when we got to the lower sections. We saw a significant difference between the areas, or our treatment groups. We saw that when we increased the receptor activity, there was way more aortic disease, hence shown by the more MMP2 product. So this is really fascinating. This is the first time that this uh, sort of effect of a stimulatory molecule and, uh, has been reported on aortic aneurysms. Immediately down the line, we'd like to take a look at 
why this effect is so different between the different regions in our female mice as well, who do not exhibit this kind of one-sided effect of disease. It, further down the line, we'd like to look, explore this as a preventative route for maybe decreasing the amount and development of aortic aneurysms that we see in the future. This study is really just one big step of a larger puzzle, and we'd like to use this to further our understanding about aortic aneurysms and how they can develop. Thank you. I wondered if you could clarify for, the, for me the, the slide. The bottom, you, there's obviously a differentiation between what's going on with the cells in the thoracic and the, in, in the abdominal region. Is the bottom chart the thoracic? Yes. Okay, I, I would have suggested you flip those so that they line up with the, with the rest of your slide. You've got thoracic mm -hmm. on top and abdominal on the bottom, okay. which is logical given the location on the, right. on the cell. So um, that was the one thing I just wanted to make. So it is the, the, the thoracic that you're seeing that, yes. that change? Yeah, it's that upper section that's showing us those uh, okay. differentiable results. Okay. And do you have any speculation as to why there's a difference between uh, male and female mice? So, interestingly, uh, in the literature, it's been shown that females have a different um, betrayal of disease than males. Males will have um, the disease concentrated in one region where females might have the disease concentrated throughout the two different regions. So as to exploring why that is, we'd like to explore maybe gene, different, uh, gene expression differences between the two regions see if there's maybe more receptors in one area for males versus females to see if that's maybe the reason that's causing different um, methodologies of disease. And is that only in the mice or is there any evidence of that occurring in humans? So this is only in the mice, or, or in the cells. This, these, these are cells that we've used. Further down the line, we'd like to use uh, a nice mouse model. But the, the, the gender differentiation, or am I missing that? Oh, or, um, no, that, that is also in humans, males are m way more likely to experience aortic okay. disease, yeah. Thank you. So you said the key word, never seen before in the literature. So has this been disclosed? <laughs> <laughs> so or do you know? It this, is, this is the first report that I've seen of um, a stimulatory effect um, in the literature. So as to like something like commercializing this, mm -hmm. I'm not sure where we could go with that, but okay. I'd love to do something about All that. Right. Okay, well, so my other question is, do you know what causes the aneurysm? So you mentioned, you know, seeing certain things in male and female mice, but what, what's the actual cause? So the, it's norm normally caused through injury, and there's other risk factors such as smoking, um, also predispositions being male, having a genetic history of uh, cardiovascular disease. So things like that kind of lead to this buildup and an inflammatory response that kind of sees that bulging effect. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a biology major and I'm working with Dr. Guo and Dr. Gong in the Department of Pharmacology and Nutritional Sciences. My research revolves around a very important receptor named glucagon-like peptide 1, or simply GLP-1. But before I dive in deeper, I'd love to share with you why I care about this specific molecule in the first place. One in three Kentuckians is at risk for diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is an illness characterized by an impairment in the way the body uses and regulates sugar for fuel. It's also one of the most prevalent, costly, and life-threatening diseases facing modern society, bringing with it a host of complications, ranging from heart disease to foot problems requiring amputation. The heat map in the top left displays distribution of diabetes in the US, and Kentucky is red hot. An emerging class of drugs being used to treat type 2 diabetes is the GLP-1 receptor agonists, or in other words, activators. These drugs function similarly to the GLP-1 hormone produced naturally in your body. They increase insulin secretion when your body needs it, slow down food as it leaves your stomach, and send a signal to your brain to tell you when you're full. In order to better understand what all the GLP-1 receptor influences and which other conditions these drugs could help alleviate, it's beneficial to know what happens when we take away the receptor's function, and what's referred to as a knockout. A major problem facing the field of GLP-1 research is inconsistency in knocking out this receptor throughout the body, something my lab hopes to overcome 
with the design of a new mouse knockout model. I've examined the efficacy of this model on a protein and RNA level. In order to accomplish the knockout, we followed the experimental design shown in the bottom left. The mice depicted in red contain specific, identifiable DNA sequences called LOXP. These sequences serve as cut here markers, and the orange mice contain the DNA scissors. More properly, they contain Cre recombinase, an enzyme that recognizes two consecutive LOXP sites and excises the DNA in between. The Cre in these mice is bound to a human estrogen receptor, as shown in the diagram to the right of the mice. This means the Cre can't enter the nucleus to access the DNA unless bound by the drug tamoxifen. Therefore, the genetic makeup of the yellow mice we've bred, combined with an injection of tamoxifen, should get rid of the GLP-1 receptor. But how do we know if this has actually worked? On the right, you'll see graphs obtained via two methods, displaying the relative protein and RNA expression, respectively, of the GLP-1 receptor in wild-type mice versus our first generation of knockouts. A technique known as Western blotting allows us to visualize the relative expression of a specific protein using antibodies. We, of course, expected that our knockout mice would have a lower, lower level of expression of the GLP-1 receptor protein than the wild types. These results are shown in the left column of graphs. Quantitative real-time PCR is a procedure that shows us a tissue's amount of RNA, which will eventually be translated into protein. And these results are shown in the right column of graphs. The hypothalamus region of the brain and an area of the small intestine were examined due to their role in metabolism. In both, both of these tissues, there is dramatically less GLP-1 receptor RNA expression in our knockouts than in wild types. For protein, this, this result is less pronounced, but still significant or trending towards significance. The liver, however, tells a different story. As you can see in the bottom right, the liver of our knockouts show no difference in GLP-1 receptor protein or RNA expression compared to wild types. This could be due to uneven distribution of that Cre recombinase throughout the body with a lower concentration in the liver. More research is needed to know for certain. Overall, the data shows that our model has great promise for knocking out the GLP-1 receptor throughout the body, but low success in the liver requires further investigation. In the future, we hope that our mouse, mouse model may be used for more GLP-1 receptor experiments, examining its relationship to Alzheimer's disease, high blood pressure, and other conditions that coincide with type 2 diabetes. With a disease as prominent as type 2 diabetes, any small breakthrough can save and improve thousands of lives. And with a trustworthy knockout model, the experimental possibilities are endless. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. So first of all, I think you are missing a great opportunity since you're working with mice to not call it gleep. <laughs> but maybe that's just me. So it, would you just summarize for me again exactly how it, thinking down the road to therapy, understanding um, gleep one, I'm going to call it, <laughs> you know, your, your ability to manipulate and control that. If I've got, if I've got diabetes, what, what hypothetical kind of therapy would this create for me? So there's actually GLP-1 receptor agonists on the market currently that are being used to treat type 2 diabetes. So um, one of the most popular is called semaglutide. You've probably seen it in commercials as Ozempic. Um, so that's already being used. It's like a weekly injection given to type 2, diabetic, type 2 diabetics. And it works how I mentioned by increasing insulin secretion and like lowering appetite. Um, but moving forward, we want to look at how if we administered Ozempic or similar GLP-1 receptor agonist drugs um, to alleviate other conditions. So most immediately, we want to look at high blood pressure. Um, we want to see if it could have like a dual benefit in that way um, and therefore kind of alleviate some of the heart disease and other problems that go along with type 2 diabetes and make it as much of a problem as it is. So I actually read an article about Ozempic uh, last week, and it's the new Hollywood drug. So people are taking it to lose weight. Um, and have you have you thought about that? I, I know that it you mentioned that it lowers your 
appetite or whatever. Have you guys looked into it as a weight loss drug by chance? Yeah, so Ozempic is actually the first ever FDA approved drug for um, obesity because it does have that appetite reducing effect. Um, I haven't heard of whether that's been misused. I assume if it's being labeled as a Hollywood drug, that might have some negative connotations. Um, but yeah, it's, it essentially um, like d sends that signal to your brain and tells you that it's time to stop eating. So that's how it decreases your appetite in that way. Oh, <clears throat> that's the same question I asked before. You've got your markdown that your end value is three for all of these. So that's your replicates. How reproducible is this? Did you do this with three separate um, strains of the mice that you produced, or was this done all from one litter and then, and then just you did three mice for each treatment? Yes, the N is the sample size, which is three mice in this case, which admittedly is small, which for um, this yellow graph here, um, you can see it's labeled not significant, even though it looks pretty close. We're thinking that with a greater sample size, we would see a greater difference. Um, but yes, we were just testing the same strain, the, these yellow mice here, our first generation of this knockout model, um, and looking at really whether that gene is knocked out or not. Like we wanted to see if it worked so that moving forward, we would be able to use that model. And this probably is beyond what you were working at, but is that, do they breed true if you use that second generation? Yes, so if we breed, if we breed the um, yellow mice yellow with mice, yeah. other mice that contain those LOXP sequences, um, even if they didn't contain the Cree, it should also be a knockout. So it would be able to like continue that line. Um, and in terms of like the Western blotting, the quantitative real-time PCR, that's all very reproducible. It's like a standard technique. Um, but in terms of the mouse model, it's kind of hard to get your hands on one right now for this specific protein, um, which is why we're trying to find one that works for our lab. And then moving forward, it would be interesting to see how we could spread that to other labs, given that um, you know the mice in red were gifted to us from another lab, and then the orange mice um, we actually purchased those from a laboratory. So the actual procedure, very reproducible. The act of getting the mice that you need to carry it out is a little bit more difficult. Okay, thank you. My name is Artin, and I'm a third year neuroscience major in Dr. Ortinsky's lab studying the neurophysiology of substance use disorder. The National Institute on Drug Abuse reports that currently there are 5.9 million Americans with a crippling cocaine addiction. One of the primary reasons why so many chronic cocaine users find it so difficult to break their addiction is due to the withdrawal symptoms that they experience, including deficits in cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to adapt one's behavior and thinking in response to changes in the environment. Something as simple as switching from one task to another requires a functional cognitive flexibility. And while there are multiple studies showing conclusively that withdrawal from extensive cocaine use impairs cognitive flexibility, the underlying neurological mechanisms by which this occurs remain to be an unsolved mystery. There's a certain group of receptors on the neurons of the brain called serotonin 2A receptors, and there are studies showing that these receptors facilitate cognitive flexibility. As it turns out, one of the regions of the brain called the claustrum has an extremely high density of these serotonin 2A receptors, which leads us to hypothesize that cocaine withdrawal impairs cognitive flexibility by altering the activity of the claustrum. Now I want you all to put yourselves in the shoes of this little rat in the top middle figure. Previously, you have received seven daily injections of cocaine or saline, but you haven't had them in six days. You find yourself inside the little box with two levers and a cue light above each lever. The left cue light turns on, and so you press the lever under the cue light, and congratulations, you get a tasty sugar reward. The next trial comes along, but this time the right cue light turns on, and so you press the right lever and are once again rewarded. After 10 consecutive correct responses, you successfully pass the visual discrimination task, and then comes the next day. 
You are now on your seventh day of withdrawal. And so I put you in the box, the levers come on, the left cue light turns on, and so you press the left lever, but you get nothing. Now this confuses you at first, but over time you come to realize that you are only getting rewarded when you press the lever on the right side of the cage, regardless of the cue lights. And so you learn to completely ignore the cue lights and only go after the right lever. The lower the number of trials it takes you to reach the passing criterion of 10 consecutive correct responses on the spatial discrimination task, the quicker you adapted and so the better your cognitive flexibility. Within 24 hours of the cognitive flexibility test, we also recorded the neuronal activity of the claustrum using a technique called calcium imaging. Now, if you notice in the bottom left figure, every time a neuron fires a signal, calcium has to enter it. Well, this is the whole basis of calcium imaging, because if we inject the claustrum with a fluorescent calcium-sensing virus that glows every time it senses calcium, we'll be able to see neurons glowing every time they fire signals, as you can see in the bottom middle figure. But so what did we actually find? Well, as it turns out, we did not observe any cognitive flexibility differences at a seven-day withdrawal. However, when we further broke up the groups by sex, we noticed something very interesting. Within the male subjects, the ones undergoing cocaine withdrawal exhibited stronger cognitive flexibility, whereas the opposite trend was observed in the female subjects. Now, these results are not quite conclusive yet because of the extremely small sample size we had. However, it does suggest that there could be sex differences in cocaine-induced cognitive flexibility effects. And as far as calcium imaging goes, we found no significant differences between the claustrum activity of cocaine and saline groups. However, when we applied ketanserin to the claustrum, which is a serotonin 2A receptor blocker, this diminished the activity of the claustrum overall, but it did so much more profoundly in the claustrum of cocaine subjects. Now, this is interesting because it suggests that prior cocaine experience sensitizes the serotonin 2A receptors of the claustrum to the effects of ketanserin, and it further suggests that prior cocaine experience could potentially increase the uh, expression of serotonin 2A receptors and therefore um, regulate the activity of the, neuronal of the neurons in the claustrum more tightly. Now, the claustrum and ketanserin are both very heavily understudied, so we really don't understand why this could be happening. However, hopefully with future experimentation, we'll be able to find out and finally answer the question of how does cocaine withdrawal impair cognitive flexibility so that we can better look for treatment outcomes and therapeutic options. Thank you. So where does ketanserin come from and why would it be something you decide to add in this case when you're looking at cocaine withdrawal? Very good question. So ketanserin, uh, as I kind of explained, it's a serotonin 2A receptor um, antagonist. So what it does is it blocks these serotonin 2A receptors and prevents serotonin from binding to them and essentially causing the neuron to fire signals. Now, we decided to add this uh, ketanserin aspect kind of last minute as a way of so we initially predicted that there would be differences in claustrum activity between cocaine and saline groups. And we figured that if there are differences, that for instance, cocaine withdrawal increases the activity of the claustrum, maybe we would, be, we would be able to bring it back down to the normal level using ket and sarin. And so we kind of wanted to try out this hypothesis, but instead we ended up finding something completely unexpected. And that's that we don't see differences normally in ACSF, which is just artificial cerebrospinal fluid. It uh, mimics the aqueous environment that the brain sits in. But when we applied ket and sarin, now we notice differences between saline and cocaine groups. It's pretty interesting. Do you have a hypothesis as to why um, it reacts differently in males and females? Why the? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so sex differences, I will preface this by saying sex differences was never really the focus of this project. Um, and that's not something our lab has ever looked into. And I'm not too well read up on it. However, it could be. Now, assuming we replicate this study and we observe similar results, because keep in mind, again, that these results are not conclusive. We cannot say with a sample size of 11 spread across four subjects that there are definitive sex differences. If we replicate the study and we'll still see the same results, it could be that the way that cocaine is interacting with um, the, for instance, estrogen synthase in males versus females, and this is causing some crazy 
hormonal shifts in females that is impairing their cognitive flexibility, but maybe not so, not so much in males. So that could be a potential explanation. Do you think 5.9 million 5.9 million Americans, yes. Thank you, thank you for having me. I am a senior biology major and I work with Dr. <coughs> Sorry. I work with Dr. Matthew Gentry in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry. Imagine what it would be like for a child whose main concerns are making new friends at school or learning how to play a sport to receive an unexpected and devastating cancer diagnosis. This diagnosis will require at least a year of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, and will negatively impact their standard of living even upon the completion of the treatment. Unfortunately, this is the reality for hundreds of children each year, as Ewing sarcoma is the second most common pediatric bone cancer. Around half of patients will develop metastatic disease, and at this point, the long-term survival rate is only 20%. It is crucial that we find novel ways to improve their treatment. In Dr. Gentry's lab, we look at the role of sugars and their metabolism and cancer progression. The food that we take in is broken down into sugars called glucose, which is really important for our body's energy. In healthy cells, this glucose is stored in bundles called glycogen. However, this is relevant to my project because abnormal and excessive accumulations of glycogen have been identified in several cancer types, including Ewing sarcoma. Additionally, I confirmed this in a preliminary study where I took 16 Ewing sarcoma patient samples from the University of Kentucky. I found that there was a significant increase in glycogen abundance in the patient's tumor tissue compared to other tissues. There are multiple steps in the synthesis of glycogen from glucose, but what I really want to point your attention to is a protein called glycogen synthase, which we think of as a sort of gatekeeper for the creation of glycogen. The goal of this project was to identify how inhibiting the activity of glycogen synthase would impact the overall progression of the disease. To look at this, we utilized two compounds called A and E that are glycogen synthase inhibitors. First, I looked at the ability of these compounds to reduce glycogen in a Ewing sarcoma cell model. I plated the cells and allowed them to grow overnight. Then I gave half of the cells a control of normal cell media and the other half a 40 micromolar concentration of either compound A or E. Additionally, in a mouse model, Ewing sarcoma cells were injected underneath the skin of the mice to initiate tumor growth. Then, the mice were given twice weekly injections of either PBS, a control solution, or compound A. Following the collection of both these cells and tumor tissue, I quantified the amount of glycogen within our samples. To do this, I utilized gas chromatography mass spectrometry. This is a tool that allows us to take the disordered mixture of materials within our sample and on a microscopic level, plates each component into an organizing bin so that it can be individually measured. I found that compounds A and E significantly reduced the glycogen abundance in Ewing sarcoma cells compared to the cells that were not treated. Similarly, mice that received an injection of compound A had a decreasing and nearly significant difference in glycogen abundance in their tumor tissue. These data demonstrate that our compounds are able to reduce the glycogen stores that this cancer uses to grow. However, further analysis revealed that these compounds alone do not have a significant impact on the ability of the cancer cells to merely survive. Therefore, our next steps were to combine our glycogen synthase inhibitors with chemotherapies so that we could not only stop the growth of the cancer, but actually kill the cancer cells. Excitingly, a combination of compound E and a commonly used chemotherapy for Ewing sarcoma patients, doxorubicin, halted Ewing sarcoma cancer cell growth and survival at multiple time points with significant differences. 
Future directions in this project should include identifying the most successful combination of glycogen synthase inhibitors and chemotherapies. Determining at what time point to give glycogen synthase inhibitors in the patient treatment timeline and assessing for reaccumulation of glycogen. Overall, these data further define the relationship between glycogen and Ewing sarcoma, describe the preclinical potential of compounds A and E, and with further research, will contribute to a more effective treatment regimen for these children. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. So where are you on testing the glycogen synthase with chemotherapy drugs? Are, is there, are there trials or more research coming up around that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, and it's very exciting stuff. What we're doing here with compound A and E is preclinical. However, these compounds are being characterized in glycogen storage disorders in different preclinical observations, but also clinical trials with good success. And I can't go into the specifics because um, they're being currently used in other labs. But what's exciting is that we are characterizing these compounds for the first time in cancer. So it's very new, but we're very excited in our next steps. Thank you. So going back to the basic uh, science here, and um, I want to make sure I understand. So it sounds like I, I, I actually wrote it down, but I can't read my handwriting. I think what you said was that the cancer uses the glycogen accumulations for growth. So it's not just that there's a, a, um, a correlation that, that you see the glyco glycogen accumulations when you see instances of the cancer, but rather the tumors themselves, the cancer is using the glycogen accumulation for uh, duplication and for feeding. Is that correct? Yes, and what's interesting about that is that we see that Ewing sarcoma does use glycogen for metastasis or invasion, in, let's say, from a bone in your leg to your lungs. That's like what metastasis would look like, and it does use glycogen. But it's interesting that there are some cancer types that have increased glycogen that don't use it for metastasis, such as renal cancer, and we don't exactly know why. We have known for a while something called the Warburg effect, where we know that cancer cells have an altered metabolism. We know that they're relying more on anaerobic or metabolism without oxygen. We know that we're relying more on those pathways, but we're still working out why and what they're using these different fuels for. Thank you. This is more curiosity than anything. Um, in your methods and results, you're showing that for the, the plated cells, you did compound E and compound A. Mm -hmm. But then in the mouse, you don't show compound E. Yes. Is there a reason for that? Because we haven't been able to do it yet. This was our first time using the mice for compound A. We've actually, this was based on a preliminary study where we used a naturally occurring glycogen synthase inhibitor called Guayacol, where we not only saw reduced glycogen, but we actually measured tumor volume throughout the study and saw that Guayacol significantly reduced tumor volume as well. We couldn't do that here because the mice that we were using had some fur and it would be difficult to measure with a little ruler. Um, but we hope to do that with compound E as well. And then with our, our assay looking at growth, we would like to see, you know, what is the effect of doxorubicin by itself, compound E by itself, different mixtures. And we even want to use um, different chemotherapies like irinotecan irid and vincristin because those are also commonly used chemotherapies for Ewing sarcoma patients. So all in a nutshell, we have so many exciting plans. Um, we're just not there yet. Is there also the plan then to use compound A with the chemotherapy treatments? Yes, we would hope to do that and even bring in different glycogen synthase inhibitors, maybe try what they would call in the clinic cocktails of chemotherapies. These kids usually get two or three chemotherapies at a time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Isha, I'm a junior biology major and I work with Dr. Graf at the College of Medicine researching lipid disorders and cardiovascular disease. Kentucky is a high-risk state concerning the development of fatal cholesterol-related diseases. Heart disease was the number one killer in the U.S. in 2019 and stroke was a fifth. As a result, 
I've been researching the implications of cardiovascular disease through the lens of a rare disease called cetostrolemia. Cetostrolemia is a rare recessive disorder that occurs in about one out of 200,000 individuals. It's characterized by elevated levels of phytosterols, or plant sterols, in the body. These plant sterols can come from outside sources, such as nuts and olive oil, so all the good stuff that the average American eats on basically a daily basis. However, the accumulation of these sterols in the body can lead to the accumulation of plaque buildups in the arteries known as atherosclerosis. And this can lead to a lot more cardiovascular disease implications further down the line, including heart attacks and stroke. In the lab, we visualize this on a Western blot. At a molecular level, cetostrolemia is caused by mutations in ABCG5 and ABCG8. These are transporters that sit at the surface of small intestine and liver cells and oppose sterile absorption. So you can see why mutations in either one of these transporters would cause the accumulation of sterols in the body and thus the cardiovascular disease implications that go along with that. A Western blot is a tool that allows us to see what proteins are in a sample and where these proteins might be located. When G5 and G8 are working properly together, they come together in the endoplasmic reticulum, move through the Golgi apparatus, and then reach the surface of small intestine and liver cells. Here, they demonstrate a double band pattern on a Western blot. When there are mutations in one or both of these transporters, this is represented by a single band pattern on a Western blot. My mentor demonstrated that only when G5 and G8 are working properly together do we see an increase in cholesterol concentration in a mouse model, seen in this bar graph. This classifies them as an obligate heterodimer, which is a fancy word meaning that they need each other in order to work. Basically, it's kind of like a toxic relationship. When G5 and G8 are working properly together, this means that they can impose sterols properly. But when there's mutations in one or both of these transporters, things can go south very quickly. Well, a couple of months ago, some researchers up at Cornell reached out to us inquiring about three novel cetostrolemia-causing mutations that they had found in a 400-patient lipid study. Furthermore, they found that one of these mutations occurred in the green transporter, ABCG8, and had the characteristics of being a dominant allele. Three out of 400 patients and a dominant allele is not very rare or recessive as cetostrolemia. As a result, my mentor and I hypothesized that maybe cetostrolemia is actually more common than previously believed. And based on other mutational analysis we've done in mutants in G5 and G8, we began to hypothesize about where these three mutations might be stopping in this process. In order to do this, I did a process called site-directed mutagenesis, where I made my three mutations, computer engineered them, and then put them into a bacterial cell through a process called transformation. Once I did that, I confirmed that I actually made the mutation through a process called Sanger sequencing, and then I transfected or introduced my mutations into a liver cell line. We use liver cells because that's where G5 and G8 are most prominent. After that, I extracted the protein and ran a Western blot. This Western blot is seen to the right side of the screen. In that very first lane, we see G5 alone, we see that characteristic single band pattern. In the third lane, we have G5 and G8 together, and we see that characteristic double band pattern. In the last three lanes, four, five, and six, those are my mutations, and we also see that double band pattern. From this, I could conclude that my mutations were occurring outside of the endoplasmic reticulum because the sugar modifications that cause that upper molecular weight band occur in the Golgi apparatus. So they have to be reaching the Golgi. They're just getting stuck somewhere else along the way. In order to discern exactly where they were getting stuck, we decided to do a process called immunofluorescence, which is looking at fluorescently tagged signals in a cell under a microscope. In that very top picture, we see G5 alone and that signal is concentrated to the nucleus. We know this because the nucleus is in blue and G5 and G8 is in red. Underneath it, when G5 and G8 are together, the signal is spread out throughout the cell and is even reaching the surface. In the bottom three panels are my mutations, and we can see that the G5, G8 signals are in weird compartments in the cell that we don't entirely know. But in the future, in order to assess exactly where they might be, we hope to put these mutations into a mouse model and measure cholesterol concentration. We also hope to learn more about ABC transporters because they carry a lot of weight in other diseases, such as cystic fibrosis. And finally, we hope to learn more about cardiovascular disease through treating cetostrolemia. Thank you, and I can take any questions. Like it. Um, so 
is, we really are so far out of my depth, Isha, I apologize, <laughs> but um, uh, give me a sense of, of how, at the very end, you were talking about some of the different ways you see this, uh, potent, your, this research potentially moving in to, to help in these other areas. Um, can you give me a sense of, of what that might be, what you're visualizing? I recognize this is pure hypothesis, but. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So in recent pharmacological advancements, they found that these small molecular chaperones have been able to rescue mutations involved in cystic fibrosis. And that's important because cystic fibrosis is an ABC regulated disease. So these are also ABC transporters. Therefore, we're kind of building a hypothesis that if those treatments work on that ABC transporter, maybe it'll work on our guy too and help rescue mutations involved in cytostrolemia and eventually treat cytostrolemia. So that's kind of a future step that we're looking at. Thank you. And actually, there was, um, I was thinking, so you said originally one in 200,000, mm -hmm. so very rare. Yeah. And then were you saying three in 400 seem to be showing up there? So obviously that's less than one in 200,000. Yeah. Um, were you able to confirm that? So that um, the, the Cornell study, so that to see that it, at least in that group of 400, it was much more prevalent. Right, so they did a lipid study, so that actually like decreases the population that we're looking at a little bit. But what's interesting about cytostrolemia is that it's a rare recessive form of a different disease called familial hypercholesterolemia. Okay. And so it's often misdiagnosed as that, and that's why we think that it's actually more common, is because it keeps getting misdiagnosed as FH, um, and then patients aren't able to understand that they have this right. disease instead. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is also a little bit outside my area here. Um, what mutation did you cause? I mean, what, what did you actually change about this so that you know that it's actually something significant? Right, so um, the three mutations that you see down there are the mutations that I caused. And so two of them are in ABCG5, which is this blue transporter. And then one of them is in ABCG8. So we basically just cause some sort of mutation that doesn't allow them to come together, doesn't allow them to move through this process, um, and basically doesn't allow them to function as they should be functioning. Um, and so that's what's being represented there. So I just want to say to you and to everybody else, by the way, um, you all have done a tremendous job here. I know you're our last, uh, uh, our last presenter, and I just want to say limitations on, for example, my knowledge and comprehension does not in any way diminish the work you all have done and your presentations here. So you, Isha, thank you. You've done a tremendous job, as have all the students here. Okay. So as Dean Brady just said, this was awesome. I mean, this was really fantastic. I think everybody did outstanding um, and to, to see the growth actually from 10 days ago to today is super impressive I think for all of you so um, I think we owe them another round of applause for the, the great presentations today and then for everybody in the audience I think we owe the judges a round of applause not only for their time and, and scoring, but also um, for the quality level of dad jokes that have been shared. So we'll thank our judges. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let everybody relax for, for a few minutes. What we're gonna do is, is the judges will go to a sequestered area somewhere unbeknownst to everyone else. Um, just behind the wall. Um, and we're gonna tally all the scores and, and discuss, and then we will come back when those discussions are done um, and announce the winners, okay? So should we say, what, at least 10 minutes? Yeah, so let's give yourself at least 10 minutes, maybe for a break, and then start heading back um, here after that. So I have 6.50 now, so let's say at seven o'clock would be the earliest that we'll start doing things, okay? All right, thank you, everyone. All right, so we're good? Yes. All right, so you can tell by the length of time, because we said seven and it's 7.20, right, that there was a lot of um, conversation that happened, and it's because, you know, to be honest, like the scores were very close um, across everything. But um, the judges did have to did choose three um, winners, and so we're gonna go backwards in order. Um, so third place is Patrick Bedros. <laughs> All right. 
Congratulations, Patrick. All right, so second place is Tanner Durst. <laughs> there you go. All right. And so first place this year is Kaylee Bolton. smile. <laughs> well done. And, and so we do have um, certificates for everyone and so uh, uh, and goodie bags. So do we want to announce everybody's name and have them the rest of everybody come up? Okay so just to yeah, again to clear no you need to take the goodie bags right there. <laughs> <laughs> It, so just, yes, we are a well-oiled machine in the Office of Undergraduate Research. No, we, this was a fantastic competition, and so we do want to congratulate everybody. So we'll start just in the way that we, we ran the competition. So Chase Easton. Um, next, the next presenter was Emily Keaton. <laughs> we will get there. I, I guess we should do presentation order, not alphabetical. Yep. Um, next was McKenna Clinch. Next was Lexi Naledi. <laughs> okay. The next presenter was Carolyn Yadis. Up next was Artin Asadapuya. <laughs> and and the last presenter was Isha Chauhan. And so when Isha is done with her photo, we're going to ask that all of you come back up and take a, a group picture with the judges. So all the, the 10 finalists come up with the judges, and this will be the last picture. Yeah, but we'll need Kaylee, Tanner, and Patrick after. So everybody up. Our team, go. Yep. <laughs> so, 
So Isha tag, and Caroline tags. Again, so congratulations, everybody. This was, this was fantastic. All right, so this concludes everything except for they get terrorized with some more pictures. So thank you, everybody, for coming. We appreciate the support.